You know that there are small companies trying to steal part of the NVIDIA pie, and if they succeed, well, it could be like investing in Microsoft or Apple in the very, very early days of personal compute. Felix here, and today we're going to dive deep into the AI chip market with some real insight from a top analyst. But more importantly, I'm going to share with you why I believe the current projections might be underestimating the potential of one key player. Nvidia. We'll also be looking at how we can trade not just Nvidia, but a number of stocks that we're going to mention here. And maybe you're thinking, well, Felix, Nvidia is already a giant that top us in. Well, that's exactly what we're going to explore here. We're going to look at the current state of the AI chip market, the challenges faced by startups, the role of big tech companies developing their own chips, and why, despite all of this, Nvidia may or may not be positioned for much, much more to come. If you're wondering why the heck you should listen to me, well, you shouldn't, but uh, we made 94% on our money so far this year on our teaching portfolio. If you want to learn how we do that, because maybe that's intriguing, then check out our beginner free live trading training on Wednesday evening this week. It's completely free of charge. Just go over to felixfranz.org slash training, I want to say. The link's down below in the description. Uh, so sign up, grab yourself a free seat, and, and be on time. Now, let's set the stage quickly by recapping NVIDIA's current dominance. As Winston, my furry friend here, might say, they're the top dog in this race, and for a very, very good reason. NVIDIA is the undisputed leader in AI chips, particularly with its GPUs optimized for machine learning tasks. The smart analyst here from Bernstein called Rasgon points out all the dollars right now are flowing to NVIDIA. But why? Well, it's not just about having powerful hardware. NVIDIA's real strength lies in its ability to continuously innovate and improve upon its own products, each generation basically competing against their own last generation. And as I always stress, NVIDIA's dominance isn't just about chips. It's about the ecosystem they've built. They've created a platform which is more than hardware. It's software tools, libraries, and developer support. And developers who are familiar with working in the NVIDIA ecosystem of tools, well, they don't want to work and learn a new set of tools. So NVIDIA has literally built a bustling city for AI development with everything that developers could ever want. So you basically have three pillars to the NVIDIA crown here. One, hardware better than everybody else's, continuous innovation, and three, this lovely, wonderful ecosystems that the de de developers absolutely love. So it's an incredible combination which keeps NVIDIA at the forefront. So who are the underdogs? Well, first underdogs, then bigger competitors, and then we'll round up the whole thing with which ones we should possibly invest and in, how we make money out of it, and, and much, much more in between. So the startups are trying to make their mark in the AI chip market. It's a little bit like Winston trying to catch a squirrel in our backyard. If you imagine that squirrel was sort of dinosaur size, there is enthusiasm there, but the odds are, well, they're not really in his favor. And then the ecosystem. Imagine you've designed the world's best AI chip. Brilliant, well done. But then you realize you need software, libraries, developer support. It's like baking the perfect cake and then realizing you need to invent the plate, the fork, the table, and the oven. And NVIDIA, or even AMD and others, have spent years building those ecosystems. They're not just selling chips. They're selling a package that developers know and trust and understand. For a startup to compete here, they need to create all of this from scratch, educate tens of thousands of developers, and try and convince each one of them that this is just better. And if they were due to do that, well, I suspect NVIDIA is going to look at it and go, well, that is actually a little bit better. Well, why don't we do that? And then three months later, come out with it. So if a startup pitches, we have a chip that's better than NVIDIA, well, it's a very tough sell because it's not about having faster chips. It's about having a chip that fits into the existing AI development landscape. So what's a startup to do? Well, the smart ones are focusing on real niche applications. They're not trying to out NVIDIA NVIDIA. They're looking for the AI equivalent of uncharted territory. So let's shift gears here. Now, we've sort of eliminated the startups, and I don't mean completely eliminated. I'm just saying it's incredibly hard to compete. What about the big players? 
in the cloud computing world, the hyperscalers. These tech giants are not just sitting on the sidelines pumping billions into NVIDIA every day, although they are, but they are arming themselves with chips. They've decided to build their own race cards instead of just buying them from Ferrari, or in this case, NVIDIA. And the Bernstein analyst hits it on the head when she says, if you're talking about like the real competition, I actually think it is more on the hyperscaler side, the, side, the cloud vendors doing their own chips. Because companies like Google, Amazon, and Meta, and to some extent Tesla, are developing their own AI chips. Why? Well, it's a bit like having a bespoke suit that really fits your business and your requirements. So these custom chips are designed perfectly for the specific workloads and infrastructure needs of those companies. And this is where it gets interesting for us investors. Enter Broadcom. Yes, they've positioned themselves as the master tailor in this scenario. Intel is betting the house on something called the 18A chip, which is their next generation process. And well, let's break it down. Intel's 18A process is the next generation of Intel's chip manufacturing. And it isn't just an upgrade, it's sort of a Hail Mary pass uh, into the fourth quarter. You see, Intel's really been struggling here to keep up with competitors like TSMC in advanced chip manufacturing. And this 18A process is their chance to leapfrog the competition and reclaim their crown. Now, if they fail to make 18A a success, then I think, uh, well, uh, we better call the undertaker. But if they pull it off, they might just reshape the entire semiconductor landscape. And, and you might be thinking, 18A, what? why is this such a big deal? Well, my, Microsoft is planning to use Intel's 18A to make their custom chips. They're not going to TSMC or, or anybody else, they're going to Intel. So that's kind of an interesting one, that this is potentially something that the biggest customers of NVIDIA are looking at using. But the pressure is on. I would say Intel probably has, uh, what, 18 months to really prove to the world that this 18A process is the way to go. Otherwise, I don't know, Titanic moment maybe. So what we're gonna look at next is like, what's the investment plan here? Right? Should we be buying the underdog, the challenger, the undisputed king or anything in between? And how do we make the most money out of it? Before we do, just think what the um, Bernstein analyst said. She said, I think the overall opportunity, the TAM, is big enough for both of them to benefit. I don't think it's a matter of one necessarily winning over the other. The market's sizable enough where I think both of them can win. Now, TAM stands for total addressable market. And in the world of AI chips, it is absolutely colossal. We're talking about a pie that's, well, talking about a pie that's, well, touching every industry from healthcare to finance, from autonomous vehicles to smart homes. Each of these sectors is hungry for more compute power, and that means more chips. Now, I do think there is a, um, not necessarily a winner takes all, but I think there is a winner takes most approach. If you look at, you know, who won from the dot-com kind of bubble, right? There was a winner takes most approach. Who's the leader in enterprise software, right? There are, it's usually one dominant player and then a few others in the niches who still make money. But the big one, I would say, is, is very, very likely to be NVIDIA. I mean, you look at cars, okay, yeah, we didn't end up with just one car company, but initially Ford dominated for a long time. You've got General Motors and Toyota and so on. But initially they started off in their local markets. They were building something niche because globalization wasn't really a thing back then. I think it's going to be harder for people to enter this than at the beginning of the last century. So I see NVIDIA dominating the general purpose AI chip sector. AMD could get a nice share of the data center applications. Broadcom might rule the custom market here for the hyperscalers. And Intel, well, if they pull off their 18A process, they could be back in the game with deals with Microsoft and others. Now, for us investors, investing in tech is always tricky because there's innovation. There is new technology that, you know, kills the previous technology. And if you bet on the wrong technology, well, you're toast. So let me explain to you my approach to investing in these companies. I'm going to pull a chart up here in tradevision.io, which is a software that we built 
which uh, A, has an AI indicator, which tells us which way the market's going to go. It's not, of course, infallible, only the purpose. But we've done quite nicely. Even stocks like this, like NVIDIA, which are insanely hard to beat because they've just gone up in a straight line. 256% up since the beginning of 2022. We actually managed to beat that by about 18%. Doesn't sound like a lot, but I can tell you, it's a very hard thing to do. And I don't think that I have a better technical understanding than certain tech wizards out there. So what I'd rely on instead is the voting machine that is the market. And in my humble opinion, the chart tells pretty much all. And if I look at this chart right now, what do we have? Well, we've got a couple of things that I would, I would highlight. I'm going to grab myself a little green line here and say, look, we have a pretty nice sort of upward trajectory there-ish, right? Not exactly perfect, but something like that. But we also have a little bit of a bearish story on top. And that is just connect these highs here. Actually, we'd have to do that again from here. And then we're looking at sort of that, right? Not exactly a perfect chart, but you know what? This little red thing up here is what I call a resistance zone. And those things are never a straight line. They're never one specific number. They're always a range. So you're looking essentially at a resistance zone from where we are at all the way up to about 135, something like that, which is this high up here. So you get one high, a lower high, another lower high, another lower high, two more lower highs, but now we're improving, we're climbing back up. So to me, this says, be patient, my friend. Be patient, wait for a breakout above at least these highs here, which sit at about 130. And we can go one further. We can actually look at what does the market do? Where is everybody positioned? We click on the top right here, see the more advanced chart, and then it pulls up the actual market positioning. You can really see where the trades are sitting. And you can see that for every week going out, and then here these green bars are the bullish positions. The bullish positions slightly counterintuitively act as resistance lines. So basically from, let me zoom in a bit more, from sort of 127 to 131, you have a lot of resistance. And if you know that, then you might want to consider buying above 131, if you are more of a short-term, medium sort of trader, which is what I mostly do, uh, rather than waiting while well, buying it now and then seeing days like Friday, where we are, so, so it's not so Friday, Monday even, um, where we go all the way up to exactly the resistance line and then come all the way halfway down again, which is frustrating. So I'm going to wait to take out the 130, 131. And the second thing I watch for is when we do end up, say, a dollar or two higher, do these resistance lines move up? If it moves from, say, 131 to 135, then I see the market believes it's going to go higher. And that's very, very important because this is voting power, essentially. And I'll give you an idea of how much voting power. Here at 131, there are, OI stands for open interest, essentially how many trades there are. There are 109,000. That's a lot. Each one of them controls 100 shares. So that's a lot of, a lot of stuff going on there at 131. So that's one thing I look at. Now, and then of course, we can look at Broadcom, which is similarly absolutely performed in a, in a stunning way. And it has a bit of a prettier chart. And I'll tell you why. Because we have a similar story of following the NVIDIA lines here, where we, you know, one, two, three lower lows, lower highs. Actually, we went even further down here. And then you've got that sort of attempt, another one lower. And then the story starts to change as we rally from this low down here all the way up, higher low, higher low, higher high, higher high. Bit of a disappointment here this week with that slightly lower high, but that's probably more to do with jobs numbers and Fed policy than anything. Um, so what do we need to do? Well, we basically need to take out the 178 here high, and then we go back up to 182 and above 182, it's time to party. We click on the more advanced chart and have a sneak peek at where positioning is. 
we can see here that it sits pretty much where we are right now. Between 175 and 185, you've got a whole like zone of resistance here that's worth looking at. And by the way, if you want to dive one deeper, you can also click on smart here, and then you can actually see dark pool trades. So you could type in your ticker here. Maybe that's NVIDIA for you. If that's what you're interested in. And then you can see Wall Street's trades every day, live, the big ones, the size, the exact time, it pulls in all, all through the day. And you get a bit of a feel for what are the really big trades doing. I normally watch only for the biggest trades, don't really care about the little ones. Uh, and that gives you a fairly good idea, again, of market sentiment over that. Now, let's also just have a look at AMD and then uh, to round us up with Intel. AMD, similar story. We had that glorious high here. This one was lower. That one was even lower. Now we have a bit of a recovery. But again, you need to take out that one. You need to take out this one to actually make this stick. And then if we look at Intel, certainly last. What do you do with a thing like Intel? Well, I think it's a, it's a, it's a stark reminder, don't buy falling knives because things can always go lower. Uh, I think a lot of people thought this was nice consolidation where we're going to go to the moon and then you get these sort of false breakouts and you come back down. And then we did that again here and it kind of looks like we're going we're gonna to repeat it. So I'd be very, very cautious and I would give this a long, very, very hard look before I do anything with it. And I'll tell you why. Say the stock goes back up to the sort of 30s, right? This lot is going to sell because they don't want to be in on something that made them feel unpleasant. Say you then break out all the way up to here, then this lot's going to sell because they don't want to be in it and they've experienced these very unpleasant lows. So if you have a stock that's come down a lot and in the recent months, in the recent year, or even recent two years, people tend to hold, to hold on to their bags for, for, for far too long, you've got these patterns, stay the heck away. So I am not touching this thing with a barge pole for a uh, probably till it doubles <laughs> or something like that. Unless you see some massive volume and you break through these levels and, you know, the story really changes because everyone wants to buy Intel again. But I think at the moment, Intel is dead as a dodo. Now, the Bernstein analyst gave NVIDIA a $155 price target, which is, you know, still decent upside. But I kind of think analysts are like sheep. They tend to just be ever so slightly above the stock price. They never really come out swinging with what they believe. I think if you look at the total addressable market, I think there is a at least a three to five X growth in GPU demand uh, that we're going to see in the, for the next five years or so. NVIDIA is going to get the lion's share of that. So I personally think a doubling of the share price is very feasible. Now, of course, it doesn't mean it's necessarily going to happen. I haven't got a crystal ball. Winston ate it. Uh, but I'm very bullish. If I had to pick one stock in this whole segment, in this whole industry, I would, would be the undisputed leader. I, I, I believe this whole um, past performance isn't an indicator of future performance. It's pretty much nonsense. If management is doing the right thing, they have a good moat, which NVIDIA does. They know what they're doing. They have tech leadership, plenty of money, all the big customers. So I think they're very hard to beat. So that's really what I'm focusing on, NVIDIA. If you got some value out of this video, um, come and join me on Wednesday evening and learn our three-step trading system. Learn how we're up 94% so far this year and share it with a friend. All the best.